Hello, Jeff Zwerink here, and welcome to Give and Take, the segment of our show where we explore important scientific ideas to help you be more confident in the truth of Christianity. Today, I'm joined by my colleague and friend, Dr. Fuzz Rana, and we're going to discuss what do we do with evolution? Fuzz, it's good to have you here today. Jeff, thanks for having me. So this is one of those topics that just seems to be kind of a, if all, all honesty, kind of a big boogeyman in the church. You know, when you talk about evolution, uh, hairs on the back of the neck get raised, uh, anxious, anxiety goes up. Um, what do we do with evolution? Because it seems like it's a very popular scientific idea. Yeah, well, I mean, to be clear, evolution is the prevailing scientific view for the, to account for the origin of life and then for the history and the design of life. Uh, and for many Christians, they see evolution as being deeply problematic and part of the reason is, is because uh, the scientific community is attributing the capacity to create to the evolutionary process. That is, mechanism can create. We don't need a mind. We don't need a creator. And so for many people, they look at the evolutionary process and they say, well, if evolution can explain everything, then why do I need a creator? And so it, evolution keeps many skeptics away from the Christian faith and creates uh, trouble and, and problems for people who hold to a Christian worldview. So, so evolution doesn't have just this singular unequivocal meaning or univocal meaning that there's actually, it's almost like when we're talking about evolution, we need to understand what type of evolution we're talking about to really engage it. Yeah, and, 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 and to be fair, evolution does mean change in biological systems over time. Mm -hmm. But the question is, what type of change are you talking about? So, for example, one form of evolution is microevolution. This would be variation taking place within a species. And so the classic textbook example would be the peppered moth changing wing colors from white to dark and dark to white in response to changes in environmental pollution. Uh, another type of evolution would be what we might call microevolution, or sorry, check that, speciation, where this is one species transforming into another closely related species. The Galapagos finches is a, the textbook example for that mm -hmm. type of evolutionary change. Uh, we are- so, so, so the distinction in those is that the, the microevolution is a, a species just kind of changing the way it looks, but nonetheless, it's still the same species, whereas speciation is that change becomes significant enough that now no longer, you have two separate species. Right. And in, in, in a sense, it's the, the microevolutionary mechanisms that are operating over significant enough periods of time and with some uh, geographical isolation of, mm -hmm. of that population into separate groups that take those microevolutionary changes down different trajectories that lead to the formation of a new species. Uh, another type of evolution would be microbial evolution, where single-celled microorganisms like bacteria can evolve, for example, resistance to antibiotics. These three types of evolution are all well evidenced, they're well established, and I don't see them as being fundamentally problematic to the Christian faith because they're not necessarily attributing creative potential to evolutionary processes. Those processes simply have the ability to fine-tune uh, pre-existing designs. The next two categories. In fact, it's, it, it even seems like those are aspects of a well-designed system that you've got yeah. creatures that can adapt to the environment rather than if the environment changes, they just go extinct. So it seems almost like those are designed well. Yes, I would actually uh, agree with that. That's a really, really good point on your part that you could see these as actually part of the design, part mm -hmm. of God's providential care for his creation. Now, the next two types of evolution are to me problematic, of, uh, not only for the Christian worldview, but problematic from a scientific perspective. One would be chemical evolution or, or abiogenesis or the origin of life, where chemicals self-assemble into the very first cells. And there's ample scientific challenges to this idea. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows how scientifically this process could have occurred through chemical evolution, but it also is ascribing creative potential to the evolutionary process. And so where we see a theological concern is also where we see scientific issues with that particular idea. The next 
uh, type of evolution. The final category would be macroevolution, where one major group transforms into another major group. And here there are some very real concerns about the capacity of evolutionary mechanisms to actually generate biological innovation. This is an outstanding question in the scientific community as to how could these mechanisms of microevolution and speciation account for biological innovation uh, and the creation of biological novelty. So again, this is where you might feel threatened from a Christian perspective about that facet of the evolutionary paradigm, but that's where there's some very real uh, and significant scientific challenges to that particular type of transformation. You know, I find your discussion very interesting there, that there are kind of these five categories, which are, you know, three of them are kind of a life adapting within some measure uh, of what's there. And then you've got these two other categories. One is uh, non-living things being transformed into living things. And the other is uh, major categories of life being transformed into other major categories of life. What strikes me as interesting there, and I'd be interested to know your comment on this, is that it seems like those middle, th th those first three that you introduced seem to fit very well with the creator, and that's where there's a lot of evidence. The two that seem to be more problematic from a theological perspective are also the ones that seem to have trouble from a scientific perspective. Yes, that's, that's you know, well said. I, I would agree with that, and that to me is really encouraging. And what it, it also says is that as a, a Christian, we can at least embrace facets of the evolutionary paradigm and, and, and don't have to adopt what many people would consider to be an anti-scientific stance when it comes to evolution, but rather we can adopt a, a stance that is, um, in fact, thoroughly scientific, where the places where we're identifying shortcomings in the evolutionary framework are the very places where experts that are working in these areas are also likewise recognizing the, the shortcomings, at least the way in which the current evolutionary framework is conceived today. So in other words, we don't have to be threatened by evolution. We can, we, we can clearly see a creator's involvement uh, in, in, in the origin and the history and the design of life through both mechanism as well as through his intervention. So last kind of quick question here as we're wrapping up. Uh, as you've engaged uh, skeptics and Christians with this kind of division of how we think about evolution. Have you found success in that people are amenable to look at that, look at it that way and see that there is uh, support for the Christian worldview, if you will? Yeah, well, for many Christians, this particular idea of five different categories of evolutionary transformations is extremely helpful in my experience. Uh, it's, I've had, have had less success engaging skeptics, in part because there is this idea that's entrenched within the mindset of many skeptics, and that is that the microevolutionary mechanisms could fully account for even large-scale biological change. Yet, when you look at the work done by people that are experts in trying to understand those transitions in life's history, particularly from a mechanistic standpoint, most of the people working in those areas would readily agree that, that the theory as it's currently conceived falls short. And, and you're, you're, you're hearing people talk about the new synthesis, right? Where there, there needs to be an extended evolutionary synthesis. And what that's saying is that, that we feel that the evolutionary paradigm is incomplete because it can't explain these very important transitions. Well, thank you, Fuzz. I really appreciate your comments. You know, when it comes to talking about evolution, the short answer is definitions are incredibly important. And so it's important to really understand what those definitions are. You know, Fuzz and some of his colleagues have written a great book that addresses this and many other topics. I would encourage you to go to reasons.org 2819 to get your copy of his book today to be equipped to go out and share the